most prophetic of all, there is Tocqueville's shrewd estimate of America's future relationship with still another powerful uh, nation. Quote from Tocqueville, There are at present time two great nations in the world, which started from different points but seem to tend towards the same end. I allude to the Russians and the Americans. Both of them have grown up unnoticed, and whilst the attention of mankind was directed elsewhere, they have suddenly placed themselves in the front rank among the nations, and the world learned their existence and their greatness at almost the same time. So, the Soviet Union wasn't coming to existence for another uh, 70, 80 years, 85 years. Um, but here's his analysis of Russia at the time. See if this doesn't fit with your understanding of the Cold War Soviet regime. All other nations seem to have nearly reached their natural limits, and they have only to maintain their power. But these, America and Russia, are still in the act of growth. All the others have stopped or continue to advance with extreme difficulty. These alone are proceeding with ease and celerity along a path to which no limit can be perceived. The American struggles against the obstacles which nature opposes to him. The adversaries of the Russians are men. So it says that America is fighting nature, you know, the great outdoors of the West and uh, growing towards the Pacific Ocean and, and mountains and the plains and stuff, while the Russians are fighting men. The former, the Americans, combats the wilderness and savage life. The latter, civilization with all its arms. Because the Russians are surrounded by countries and America is surrounded by wilderness. The conquests of the American are therefore gained by the plowshare, those of the Russian by the sword. Now that sentence there I thought was particularly true of the Cold War Russia. Um, definitely uh, by the sword is how they conquer. The Anglo-American relies upon personal interest to accomplish his ends and gives free scope to the unguided strength and common sense of the people. The Russian centers all the authority of society in a single arm. The principal instrument of the former is freedom, of the latter, servitude. Servitude. He saw that 80 years before Soviet Russia came to exist. Servitude is their, their principal instrument. Their starting point is different, and their courses are not the same. Yet each of them seems marked out by the will of heaven to sway the destinies of half the globe. How true, how very, very true and astute were his remarks comparing Russia to America. Now we skip a couple pages down. Tocqueville writes in the 1830s, Nothing is more striking to a European, tra European traveler in the United States than the absence of what we term government. Interesting. He says that it, there just isn't any government in the United States. You travel around and where you, in Europe you expect this, that, and the other to be done by government. There's nobody doing it, and if anyone's doing it, it's by some private institution that people have put up. He mentioned earlier, and I skipped it, he said, Americans are always, forever, getting together in organizing groups, either to disseminate books, or to send missionaries out to the far corners of the world, or to do this or that. Americans are always getting some group together to accomplish something, which in Europe is done by uh, government, if it's done at all. We skipped to the end of the page. Today, the American press is marked by a constantly declining number of independent publications. Oh God. They've been saying that. They've been saying that forever. People are still, people are upset in the 1990s about Clearwater radio station or something like that taking over. Oh, it's, everybody's, oh, we all have to get our information from the same place. It, you think it would have happened by now? If they've been pointing it out since the 1830s, you'd think we'd be down to one source for news. Um, funny enough, Russia has and had one source for news. Look at um, Britain today. Uh, one source for its news, BBC. Right? Monolithic government control. Everyone 
it gives this evil foreboding of how American, the Americans are all going to be beholden to one source for news and information, the way that other people already are by design. And yet, it never does come about. America still hasn't gotten to that point. I'm a little sick of hearing it. Um, uh, so, constantly declining number of independent publications, the rise of great newspaper chains, and by a generally pervasive emphasis upon the manufacture of public opinion through the various means of mass communications. Uh, it's just like what you hear today. It's like they read this and thought that it was published in the 1990s or something, and they're just kind of running with it. Well, that's the end of what we need to take from uh, uh, Richard Hefner's introduction. But now we do get to go to the author's introduction. Uh, his introduction is less than ten pages, of which we will probably sample about a third. Amongst the novel objects that attracted my attention during my stay in the United States, nothing struck me more forcibly than the general equality of condition among the people. That's interesting. Everybody says that uh, there is, you know, the richer getting richer and the poor getting poorer, and capitalism is going to exacerbate this fact. And he says, no, people are equal there. They are equal. It gives a peculiar direction to public opinion and a peculiar tenor to the laws. It imparts new maxims to the governing authorities and peculiar habits to the governed. Now, the governing authorities uh, aren't able to treat people in such a stratified way. They can't have one way to treat the nobles and one way to treat the uh, underclass. They have to have one way to treat citizens, humans, people. And uh, same thing, habits of the governed. Do not take lightly. You don't just bow and take from the government whatever the government says it's going to do to you if you feel like you're equal to everybody else in society. Now, if you feel like you're downtrodden, you're part of the lower classes, you're forever going to be on the underside, you're just screwed in the deal, then you'll take whatever they stamp on you. But in America, that wasn't true. People didn't have that attitude. I soon perceived that the influence of this fact extends far beyond the political character and laws of the country, and that it has no less empire over civil society than over the government. It creates opinions, gives birth to new sentiments, founds novel customs, and modifies whatever it does not produce. So this, uh, the equality of people, he says, has effects all throughout society in profound ways. The more I advanced in the study of American society, the more I perceive, perceived that this equality of condition is the fundamental fact from which all others uh, seem to be derived, and the central point at which all my observations constantly terminated. His observations just kept coming back to the fact that everybody's equal. We all have equality of condition. Now, he was saying this, strangely enough, in a time when slavery still existed, and women were basically uh, servile. They didn't get the vote for another hundred years almost. So, um, uh, very perceptive of him to see a basic notion of equality in the American way of life before we had even committed to it ourselves. We decided later, all right, if we're going to have this thing where we're all equal, then we've got to have blacks be equal and we've got to have women be equal. We can't keep saying that we're all equal except for we're more equal than some. And before we even got to that point, Tocqueville was able to notice this. Okay, now he speaks to the fact uh, that democracy is on the rise and people are not putting up with the servile conditions of, of government control anymore. Quote, It is evident to all alike that a great democratic revolution is going on amongst us, but all do not look at it in the same light. To some, it appears to be novel, but accidental, and as such, they hope it may still be checked. To others, it seems irresistible, because it is the most uniform, ancient, and permanent tendency which is to be found in history. So some people are thinking democracy is just a new fad, don't worry about it, it'll go the wayside. And other people say, no, this is the inevitable evolution of way th the way things go. The most ancient, permanent tendency to be found in human history is the tendency towards the people ruling themselves. That's a beautiful thought.